The, the, the third bit is the, the difficult bit. Um, I have reported these crimes over 330 times. On five occasions, they have got as far as the Crime Prosecution Service in this country. And every time, either the police or the Crime Prosecution Service or the ICC have said, well, we can't prove uh, intent to commit genocide. Now, I have put up a lot of evidence which I believe uh, proves intent to commit uh, genocide, and that's what we want to go through this afternoon. So, what do we mean by intent? Uh, if you turn the page to page 12, I'd like to just read the legal definition of intent, which is defined very clearly in the legislation. A person has intent, one, in relation to conduct, where he means to engage in the conduct, and two, in relation to a consequence, where he means to cause the consequence, or is aware that it will occur in the ordinary course of events. The knowledge means awareness that a circumstance exists, or a consequence will occur in the ordinary course of events. I'll just take the knowledge thing first. What they mean by that is that if you know, uh, if you choose to fire a cruise missile, but you know that a cruise missile is full of explosives, and when it lands, it is going to explode, and it will kill people in the vicinity. That is knowledge, and it proves that you know what you're doing. If you were fired a cruise missile and didn't know what it was and was expecting it to distribute leaflets or something, then that wouldn't be the case. But most people know perfectly well that a cruise missile is an explosive, high explosive weapon. Right, going back to the um, intent. I maintain that there are at least six separate ways in which one can establish a person's mindset, their intent. And it's those things that we need to go into in some depth. So I've listed them there. Firstly, you can establish a person's intent from their published oral and written statements. What they say, um, that's very often what they intend to say. Their intent. Two is a choice of conduct, a course of action. So if they choose a particular course of action deliberately, that is an indication of their intent. The third one, I think, is probably one of the most important, and that is repetition of a conduct after the consequences are known. So that if you uh, if you fire a cruise missile into uh, a village and it kills a lot of people, and you hear about it, and you hear about the effects, and you say, "Oh, good, right, we'll do that again and again." And again, and you do it again a hundred thousand times, to my mind that proves that issue. We'll come to that in a minute. Four is the rejection of all nonviolent options and alternatives. If there are nonviolent options or alternatives in front of you, and you choose the, the route to violence, the violent alternative, that to my mind is proof of intent to kill. Five is prior knowledge of the consequences of their decisions. You know a cruise missile has that effect, or a bomb has that effect, or a cluster bomb is going to kill children and farmers. And that is intent to kill. And finally, prior knowledge of the law. You know that it is a crime to kill children. Then, when you kill children, that proves intent. So, by establishing a person's prior knowledge of the law and what the law is in relation to attacking other people you can prove intent. So very briefly, I'd like to go through one or two of these. Let's take the first one, published statements. I think uh, the key phrase from my point of view uh, that Tony Blair proved his intent, proved Tony Blair's intent, is that that took place in Basra shortly before he uh, returned to hand over the prime ministership, prime ministership to Gordon Brown. He was talking to officers and men, a group of them, about 70 of them, at Basra Air Base, and they were complaining about the uh, effects of the war on them, and on their colleagues, and importantly, on Iraqi civilians. 
And Blair's response was, so we are killing more of them than they kill us. You're getting back out there after them. It's brilliant, actually. Now, to my mind, that statement is fundamentally important. It shows the man is, has been intending to kill Iraqi citizens, civilians, children, men, women, and children, for four years. And he is still, after four years of it, encouraging the soldiers to go out there and to kill again. I find that utterly unbelievable. What is more unbelievable is that when he makes these statements, nobody in this country reacts. Everybody seems to support it. The Queen, the Cabinet, the Parliament, the media. Why on earth don't we know more about what is actually happening? So that's the first thing that I would say. That proves his intent. <coughs> There is one more I want to draw attention to, and that took place in Parliament. When Jack Straw stood up, there was a very important debate, uh, the Iraq War debate. It took six hours. It was opened by Tony Blair and was closed by Jack Straw. And he said, but as elected members of Parliament, we all know that we will be judged not only on our intentions, but on the results, the consequences of our decisions. Yes, of course there will be consequences if the House approves the government's motion. Our forces will almost certainly be involved in military action. Some may be killed. So too will innocent Iraqi civilians. I urge the House to vote with the government tonight. Now there's a man who has said, look, we're going to kill people, and I urge you to support us. To my mind, that is absolute proof of intent to kill. Let's move on to the second of the six criteria, the choice of conduct. Although our leaders had at least a hundred peaceful legal options open to them, such as negotiating peacefully, continuing with the weapons inspections, continuing the destruction of Iraq's long-range rockets, Allowing the UN Security Council to find a peaceful solution, withdrawing totally from involvement with Iraq, disabling Iraq's military communication systems, instigating anti-government sanctions, continuing UN sanctions, etc., etc. Although all of those options were available, they chose to pursue the illegal actions of waging a war of aggression and using armed force in the certain knowledge that the consequences would be injury and death of thousands of Iraqis. I maintain this is further proof of their intent to commit genocide. The third element is the repetition of combat once consequences were, consequences were known. Chris, it would be helpful if you're reading from this, can you give us a page of cards? Sorry, page 14, right at the top. Great. What do we see? Even four years after the war started, and after hundreds of thousands of totally innocent Iraqis had been killed and injured, Tony Blair was urging the troops to continue to kill. If a person's actions lead to the death of an individual, and the perpetrator then halts his or her activities on the grounds that the deaths were accidental or unintentional, the perpetrator goes some way to proving that the initial death or deaths were not intended. If, however, the perpetrators, knowing perfectly well that more innocent people will be killed, repeat the course of action and kill more people, they demonstrate their intent to kill. Because MPs and peers were aware of the mortal consequences of their decision to wage war, and because they failed for six years to withdraw or reverse Parliament's orders, they have proved conclusively that they were acting with intent to kill. As their intent to kill was focused on Afghans and Iraqis, this will be taken by a court and a jury as proof positive of intent to commit genocide. The fourth one is the rejection of non-violent options and alternatives. I think I've covered that, but I'll just say, when a person is faced with a number of alternative courses of action 
and then deliberately chooses to pursue the only option leading to death and destruction over the hundreds of options that are available for the non-violent. Their free choice of the sole course of action resulting in death proves their intent to kill them. If they'd chosen the peaceful negotiation option, they would have proved their intent to negotiate or their intent to act peacefully. Fifth one, the prior knowledge of the consequences of their decisions. A person only chooses to use a cruise missile if they intend to kill people in the vicinity of the explosion. Or cluster bombs, if they intend to kill large numbers of men, women, and children within three kilometers of the target. If a person chooses to use depleted uranium tipped artillery shells with a half life Oh, I've been told now, I should say, 4 billion years, not 4,000. With a half-life of 4 billion years, knowing it will cause birth defects, cancers, deformities, and miscarriages, it demonstrates their intention to cause serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Any person who makes a deliberate choice to use weapons of this nature, in the knowledge that such weapons will kill indiscriminately, intends to kill large numbers of people. And lastly, the prior knowledge of the law and the criminal offences on the next page. Further evidence of ministers' intent to kill is provided in the secret legal advice I referred to it this morning, from the Attorney General to the former Prime Minister on March the 7th, two weeks in advance of the invasion. In the final section of his advice, the Attorney General draws the Prime Minister's attention to the potentially unlawful consequences of going ahead with the war. He said, you will wish to take account of the ways in which the matter might be brought before a court. Two further, though probably more remote possibilities, are an attempted prosecution for murder on the grounds that the military action is unlawful, and an attempted prosecution for the crime of aggression. Aggression is a crime under customary international law which automatically forms part of domestic law. Now, to my mind, that is Lord Goldsmith and Tony Blair identifying that they were committing, would be committing crimes. They knew it was a crime of aggression. They knew it was a crime of murder. That was two weeks before they started the aggression and the murders. It's proof intent to kill. So I maintain that when taken together, these six elements prove that individually and collectively members of the United States Congress, Britain's Parliament, Britain's <coughs> leaders and others deliberately and intentionally set out to destroy part of the Iraqi national group and in so doing committed the criminal offences of genocide and conduct and civilian genocide. Now finally, I'll just go into the last of the four elements of genocide, and that is the conduct took place in the context of a manifest pattern of similar conduct directed against that group, or was conduct that could itself affect such destruction. The state policy authorized by Congress and Parliament of using trained military forces to use high explosive indiscriminate weapons to attack undefended villages, towns, and cities across Iraq, killing and injuring thousands of innocent civilians, quite clearly constitutes a manifest pattern of similar conduct directed against that group. And as such, satisfies the fourth of the four elements of the crime of genocide by killing. In addition, thousands of attacks by coalition aircraft in which high explosive bombs and rockets killed several people simultaneously constitute on their own conduct that could itself affect such destruction and as such satisfy the fourth element of the crime of genocide. So I maintain then that the proof of genocide is absolutely clear and that we need to pass this information on and persuade our law enforcement officers in this country and in the Hague and in America to do what they're paid to do, which is to prosecute criminals, particularly criminals who commit genocide.
Thank you very much, Mr. Cavadell.